Hello, my name is Nicola Morby and I'm an Art Society lecturer. As some of you will already know, I'm an art historian specialising in the great British painter JMW Turner. We're not currently able to get out to art galleries and exhibitions, but I'm delighted to be able to talk to you today in the comfort of your own homes, here from mine, about a little piece of art which you might just have somewhere in the house. And that is this, the new £20 note featuring Turner, recently released by the Bank of England on the fittingly appropriate date of the 20th of February 2020. So in numbers, that's 200220, nearly but not quite a palindrome. Now I'm sure many of you have had your hands on one of these since then, but I wonder how closely you've really looked at it up until now. One of the things I often like to discuss in my teaching and lectures is the changing ways that Turner's art is presented and received and how that relates to ideas about Britain and British identity. So this seems an appropriate moment to discuss his latest and most high profile reincarnation. Aside from being really good news for Turner, I genuinely think this is also a significant moment for art history because Turner is the very first British artist to appear on a banknote and I would like to think that this marks a change in the national attitude towards art in this country. I was very struck, for example, by the BBC's television series 100 Greatest Britons back in 2002. You may remember it, it was a highly publicised poll to determine who the British people felt were the 100 greatest Britons in history. And I remember at the time being dismayed that there weren't any artists on the list, apart from William Blake, who I don't think was there because of his art, but rather for writing the hymn Jerusalem. So this list seemed to suggest that art was not something that we as a nation consider an indication of greatness, unlike politics or literature or science or even music. But here we are 18 years later and what greater affirmation for national heroism is there than to appear on a banknote? I think this is a major endorsement for the role of the arts within Britain, the value that we place upon them and how they define us as a collective. And I think it's definitely one worth celebrating with the Art Society. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the background to Turner's arrival on the note, how that came about, and then discuss his representation on the note itself, how the Bank of England have chosen to embody the man and his works within this very particular populist visual format. But first of all, why do we have characters on banknotes? This wasn't always the case, and in fact, during Turner's lifetime, all the way up until the later 20th century, notes look much simpler in appearance, being one-sided and comprised almost entirely of black lettering upon a plain white background. The only notable visual was a small vignette of the figure of Britannia. But a change occurred in 1970, when for the first time, the Bank of England started to feature individual portraits of British historical figures on its notes. And these characters were included as a security feature, since it was realised that the human eye recognises faces more readily than patterns, and therefore was more likely to spot forged inaccuracies on portraits. But this was also a moment to say some very particular things about Britain. And so since the 1970s, we've had notes featuring various leaders and innovators and pioneers in their field, men and women who can be said to have shaped British society. If we consider the 20 pound notes of the past, for example, they have successively featured William Shakespeare, scientist Michael Faraday, composer Edward Elgar, and most recently, economist and philosopher Adam Smith. When the time came to replace Adam Smith 
in order to issue a new updated Parliament note, the bank opted to choose for the very first time a representative from the visual arts and to this end the general public were invited to submit nominations. Around 30,000 people did so, sending in their votes, and hundreds of individuals were suggested representing the depth and breadth of artistic endeavour in Britain. From this long list of nearly 600 possible suggestions, the bank whittled down a short list of five candidates, all of whom met their necessary criteria, which was, firstly, the chosen individual should have significant artistic achievements. Secondly, they also needed to have made a contribution to British society. And thirdly, they must have an unquestioned lasting legacy. You might be interested to hear who else was on this short list. Aside from Turner, the other names under consideration were film legend Charlie Chaplin, sculptor Barbara Hepworth, painter and satirist William Hogarth, and ceramicist Josiah Wedgwood, all of whom, of course, had prolific and extraordinary careers. But ultimately, in 2016, the then governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, chose JMW Turner. And why? Well, to quote Mark Carney, Turner's art was transformative, his influence spanned lifetimes and his legacy endures today. He said, I am delighted that the work of arguably the single most influential British artist of all time will now appear on another two billion works of art. And they really are works of art, aren't they? This one is the work of Debbie Marriott, the first female designer appointed by the Bank of England. And she and her team were responsible for distilling Turner's various achievements within the distinctive look and format that we expect from our paper currency. And if you take the time to really examine it closely, it's beautifully composed and rendered and cleverly captures the essence of the featured personality. The 20 apparently is also the most counterfeited of all the denominations, which meant that a key part of the design brief was also the inclusion of a number of new high security features. Incidentally, I can only assume that Turner himself would have found this whole process completely fascinating because he actually owned a copy of a book about this very subject, a publication called Hansard's Report on the Mode of Preventing the Forgery of Banknotes, published in 1819. It's listed in the inventory of his library and we know he read it because it's annotated with his own observations. I'm sure in his wildest dreams, however, Turner could never have imagined that one day his own face would appear on such an item. So let's now have a look at that face. Not only is Turner the first artist to appear in a banknote, he's also the first to be represented by a self-portrait, which is this one and it's derived from an oil painting dating from around 1799, when Turner was about 24 years old. And what does this image tell us about the way the artist has chosen to represent himself? Well, I'm always struck by the directness of his demeanor. Despite his youth, he's holding his head up high and unapologetically facing down the gaze of the world with this very assured and uncompromising stare. He has also, I think, portrayed himself rather elegantly dressed in waistcoat and silk cravat and jacket. He's depicting himself rather like a gentleman, a man of means and social standing. And you don't get the sense that this is someone just starting out in their professional life but rather someone who is confident that they've already made it. And in fact, Turner probably painted the self-portrait to commemorate a really important moment in his career, his election as an associate of the Royal Academy, the most prestigious and dominant art establishment of the period. So this was a triumphant moment for Turner. 
Not only was he unusually young to receive such an endorsement, it was also a significant achievement for an artist who'd chosen to specialise in landscape, which at the time would have been considered intellectually inferior to the more highly revered genres such as history painting or portraiture. But from the outset of his career, Turner really made it his mission to prove that landscape could be as powerful and varied and academic as any other painting genre. He was determined to intellectualise the art form and from the age of 15, he'd been exhibiting dramatic and serious pictures at the Royal Academy, showcasing his extraordinary ability to render nature's effects convincingly in paint. And these paintings were so widely admired and well received, they'd gained him the recognition and approbation of his peers. And it was this which ensured his confirmation as an associate of the Royal Academy, a major mark of professional success and hence the self-portrait. Turner had been born into very lowly social circumstances. His father was a working class barber from Covent Garden. And this portrait records Turner's pride and satisfaction at this upward mobility. Now for the banknote, that self-portrait was digitally engraved translating what was initially a tonal image into a sequence of lines and dots and dashes in order to try to replicate the look of the characteristic intaglio style traditional on paper money. Now, although much of the draftsmanship was done via computer, the actual printing is still done using traditional plates with those closely built up patterns of lines scored or incised directly into the metal plate, which is then ink, inked up and printed on a press, very similar to the way that engravings were made during the 19th century. As someone who was closely involved in supervising the production of reproductive copies after his own work, Turner would have been very familiar with this process. Um, this topographical view behind me, for example, is an engraved version of a turn of watercolour of Coventry dating from the 1830s. And the artist would have worked in very close collaboration with the printmaker to achieve the high quality, the artistry evident here. So for this banknote, Turner would have immediately understood how the designer took his image in oil and then reimagined it within these closely built up patterns of lines, the areas of cross hatching, and these stippled dots. Incidentally, the transformation of Turner's portrait from oil into engraved form apparently posed some challenges. The hair was particularly difficult to render convincingly. In the original painting, it's rather loosely defined. Whereas on the note, you get more of a sense of individual strands and locks. And small changes also had to be made to the eyes in order for it to work as an image within its own right. Now, how accurate a likeness of Turner this actually is, is an interesting question. If you compare contemporary drawings and description of, of him, we sense perhaps that the self-portrait is rather complimentary. Nobody ever describes Turner as good looking. And instead he's recorded as being rather short and unprepossessing. And I think one thing that he certainly downplayed with this frontal angle is the size of his nose, which in profile was rather large and prominent. So this is much more flattering angle. And in fact, Turner didn't like his physical appearance at all. And this is probably why the self-portrait of 1799 was the last time he ever chose to paint his own likeness. He reportedly said, it is no use taking such a little figure as mine. It will do my drawings an injury. People will say such a little fellow as this can never draw. But draw, he most certainly could. By the way, during this period, drawing doesn't simply mean sketching in pencil. It really refers to painting in watercolour. 
and by the time that Turner painted his self-portrait, he was already widely recognised as a supreme master of watercolour. And there's a reference to Turner's fame with watercolour, particularly his topographical views of British landscape, within the £20 note, and it is this one, this window motif in the bottom left-hand corner. The Gothic shape of the window is derived from a watercolour that Turner painted during the 1790s of the ruins of Tintin Abbey in Wales, one of the most popular picturesque tourist destinations of the period. Turner's use of watercolour, even in this very early um, time in his career, was actually considered almost miraculous for its sophisticated and innovative handling and the way that he emotionally engaged with the atmospherics of a location and was able to poetically hint at the varied historicity of a site, the layering of past and present. And the fact that he wasn't doing that simply with the famous sites of classical Italy as was traditional, but rather with the native landscape of the Wye Valley, for example, placed Turner firmly at the centre of the Romantic movement in Britain. So it's very fitting that Tintin Abbey should be included here on the banknote. And as you can see, this part of the polymer is transparent. I love the fact that it's a clear window that you can actually look through. Now, it's not the only see-through element on the note. We also have another window here, which brings in a different set of references to Turner's biography. And that's this one to the right of the portrait, which I hope you can see features a lighthouse. Now on the Turner side, it's silver, but if you turn it over to the obverse, you can see that the lighthouse is picked out in gold with blue behind. And it's this combination of foil colors, which make the note very difficult to counterfeit. And then behind the lighthouse, you'll see that there's the profile of a contemporary piece of architecture. Now, both of those structures celebrate a very personal connection that Turner had with the Kentish seaside resort of Margate, one of his favorite places in the world. He would regularly catch a steamer from London and go all the way down the River Thames, out past the estuary, to Margate, which is situated right at the tip of the eastern coast. And just facing the point where he disembarked from the steam ferry, he found a lodging house that he really liked. It was run by a widow called Mrs. Sophia Booth. And this was the perfect location for him to sit and paint, looking past the pier and the lighthouse and observing the panoramic sweep of the beach and the sky with its cycle of ever-changing weather and light effects. Skies which he would memorably de declare were the loveliest in Europe. Now Turner's fondness for Margate as a place extended eventually to Mrs Booth as well and they formed a lasting intimate relationship. They eventually lived together in London, she looked after him until the end of his life. And if you go to Margate today and walk out along the arm of the sea wall and you walk to the current lighthouse, standing just underneath it, you will find a lovely modern bronze sculpture depicting Mrs. Booth. She's been portrayed as though she's a lady made of shells and she stands gazing out to sea. So the Margate window on the note symbolizes both Turner's personal life but also his legacy, because if you look back past Mrs. Booth to the seafront behind, exactly on the site of her former boarding house is now situated the present day Turner Contemporary Gallery, a contemporary art space opened in 2011. And the striking building with its distinctive mono-pitched roofs is that designed by David Chipperfield and a silhouette of contemporary is what is featured on the banknote behind the lighthouse, symbolizing this very concrete and lasting memorial to the artist's connection with Margate and making it a very active and vibrant presence, 
within the present day social and economic regeneration of the town. Aside from the self-portrait, the most obvious feature on the new 20, and one which I'm sure needs no introduction, is the fighting Temeraire. Turner's iconic masterpiece in oil, painted in 1839, which he described as his darling, and which has since become the nation's darling. Back in 2005, it was officially voted the nation's favorite artwork, and it's been reproduced countless times on every conceivable kind of commercial product. For the banknote, the painting isn't precisely reproduced, largely, of course, because of the necessity of having to alter the original colours in order to include the designated denomination colour, which for the 20 is always purple, perhaps not the easiest colour to operate with but the essence of the piece is still there. And in particular, the symbolic contrast between old and new, evident both in the flamboyantly colored sunlit sky here on the right, and that contrasts with more tranquil, cooler colors on the other side, but also particularly in the depiction of the Temeraire herself as this ghostly, ethereal sailing ship. She was a, a celebrated warship and a veteran of the Battle of Trafalgar. And in the picture, she's being towed to her final resting place, a breaker's yard in Rotherhithe by the dark and dumpy modern steamship. Now the fighting Temeraire really is a sensational painting. And in many ways, it is the perfect image to have on a British banknote because the whole thing is like an ode to Britain, a sort of a national anthem, if you like, a patriotic evocation of the history and triumphs of the nation and its people, those things which make Great Britain great. The effects of the sun in the picture can be read as those of a sunset. So the sun is sinking on the last hours of the Temeraire marking the passing of the Age of Sail, the era of Lord Nelson and Britannia's dominance on the waves. And the painting can be seen to be full of elegiac poignancy. But the sun can also be interpreted as rising on the new industrial era, the Age of Steam, heralding British progress, ingenuity and resolution. And above all, I think the message of the Temeraire is one about resilience, tenacity of spirit, and the endurance of hope across the passage of time. Just as the sun rises and sets during the day, it is the natural order of things for one epoch to give way to another. And what matters, Turner is saying, is the ability to adapt and evolve. The Temeraire isn't just being towed down the river to be destroyed, she's going to be broken up so that her constituent parts can be recycled, employed in building and construction use. So she therefore represents renewal and regeneration within modernity rather than re a reactionary antidote to it. Similarly, with the picture, Turner shows us that art shouldn't just be a vehicle for looking back, but can be a language for engaging with the future, the prism through which we can filter and understand our own times and the world in which we live. The Fighting Temeraire was first exhibited in 1839 in the Royal Academy's new premises, which at that time were within the National Gallery, which of course as a building stands along the north perimeter of Trafalgar Square in London. Turner had actually seized a very opportune moment to paint this picture. Trafalgar Square had only recently been reconstructed and renamed in honour of the famous naval victory of 1805, and a committee was already at work on erecting a monument to Lord Nelson there. That, of course, would eventually become Nelson's column. So by painting his own homage to the naval hero, Turner is astutely riding a patriotic wave of nostalgia and commemoration, and when it was exhibited, it was almost universally hailed as a masterpiece. 
The fact that Turner then refused to sell his painting, despite being offered £5,000, which was an astronomic figure, and then even a blank cheque, well, that demonstrates that he, did, he was determined to leave his most beloved and iconic work to the nation after his death. And that is indeed what happened. The Temeraire eventually came to the National Gallery for good, where it can be seen today as one of the jewels of the National Collection. This connection is alluded to on the note. Firstly, by this purple outline, the one which encloses the Margate motifs. And as you can see, it's a distinctive quatrefoil shape, and that has been derived deliberately from the two fountains in Trafalgar Square, those which flank Nelson's column in front of the National Gallery. Secondly, it's also immortalised here by Turner's signature, which is the one that has been taken directly from his last will and testament, an astonishing document in which Turner left all the unsold paintings in his studio, including the Fighting Temeraire, to the nation. It's a vast and unique collection known today as the Turner Bequest, and it comprises thousands of oils, drawings, and watercolours. As a body of work, it was too extensive for the National Gallery alone to accommodate, and eventually it passed to the National Collection of British Art, which became known as the Tate Gallery, and ultimately a new gallery was built to house it at the Tate, and that was the Claw Gallery. And again, this physical embodiment of Turner's legacy is represented on the banknote. It's this circular purple foil patch here. This stylized motif has been based upon the beautiful rotunda spiral staircase at Tate Britain, a very elegant architectural feature which formed the centerpiece of the recent renovation of Tate Britain, linking the original Victorian neoclassical spaces with a much needed modernization of the lower levels. So once again, this theme of old and new and the transition of time. There are also some further additional features of the note, which are a bit more interactive and which are acutely appropriate for this celebration of the great painter of light, moments which actually require light to play an active role in the functionality of the object. So first of all, if we look again at the window with the Margate lighthouse, and if I move it around, I hope you can see that the window contains a really lovely holographic effect so that the lamp of the lighthouse appears to throw out radiating beams in concentric rainbow circles. And this gorgeous effect is a perfect visualization of the quote found at the bottom of the note, which says, light is therefore color. Now that's a quotation taken from a lecture that Turner gave at the Royal Academy in 1818. It's perhaps a lesser known fact about Turner that he was a lecturer himself. For 30 years, he held the position of professor of perspective at the Royal Academy. And part of the remit of that role was to give a series of illustrated talks about his subject to the student body and to other colleagues. Unfortunately, Turner was rather a poor public speaker. He is reported as mumbling and speaking too quickly. He muddled his notes and he regularly lost his train of thought. And people also complained about his cockney pronunciation of words. And all of this rendered much of the content incomprehensible. I doubt he would have qualified to become an art society lecturer. But what the audience did appreciate were his beautifully painted lecture diagrams, which often explore themes which fascinated him within his work, and particularly the role of light and shade and colour and tone in our perception of the world. And so that quote, light is therefore colour, is like a sound bite, a concise description of Turner's whole approach to art. If I now turn the note over to the front, the side featuring the Queen, I can show you here another hidden security component which requires light, and that is concealed here 
within the middle of the Bank of England script at the top, um, I have here a torch which emits UV, ultraviolet light. And if you shine that in the right place, you should see emerging a number 20, which is otherwise invisible to the naked eye. And in very strong ultraviolet light, it actually shines out in bright red and green. Ultraviolet rays, so those beyond the visible spectrum, were first discovered in the early 19th century. And it's not a coincidence that Turner was painting his light drenched canvases in an age of pioneering scientific discovery when there was enormous focus on light being measured and quantified and understood. Finally, I'd like to end with an embellishment, which is yet another first for a banknote. And also I think is a very fitting tribute to Turner's engagement with modernity and the new developments of his own day. Using the mobile camera app, Snapchat, you can download a free augmented reality photo lens. And if you take your mobile phone and place it in front of the banknote, this animates the image and you see the sun illuminating Turner's signature into a glowing inscription. And then we see the fighting Temeraire brought to life. You can even hear the sound effects recreating the dynamics of the scene, the seagulls, the lapping of the waves, even the steamship itself. And you can imagine yourself standing on the banks of the Thames with the sun glinting on the water, modern technology spinning its own work of art and giving us a place to escape to when we have to stay where we are. Thank you very much for joining me.